Welcome to the Simpleton Podcast. We're honored today to be interviewing a bishop. I want to explain where this interview is coming from, because I think a lot of you are going to wish I asked some questions that I'm not going to ask. What I'm trying to get at with this interview is what is a bishop? I'm going to let Bishop Johnston take this interview wherever he wants, because I think that's the most interesting. Um, my goal is not to just give the bishop a platform. Uh, he already has a platform, and uh, he frankly is welcome to our platform if he does want to get a message out. But the real goal here is there are so many conversations amongst Catholics about what should the bishop do. Shouldn't the bishop act out or correct this theological problem or this liturgical problem or this? Shouldn't they speak out on this political issue? Shouldn't the church fund my new school or fund this idea? Or why is the church mismanaging? You know, and I think a lot of these conversations don't really have an adequate idea of who the bishop is and what his job is. I think if we can use this podcast to explore what is a bishop, how are they chosen? What takes up their time? Are they like scandal managing all the time? Are they just doing accounting and making sure we don't go bankrupt as a church? Are they actually evangelizing and leading the church? Are they just hurting us to keep us from falling apart? Like these are the questions that like, what is the bishop doing? And I think if we can talk about that and talk about like what the role of the bishop is in the church at this point in history, I think that would be very informative for all of us whenever we're having these weird conversations about what should the church be. So that was my goal here is to give us all a better understanding of what bishops are all about, because I think that'll give us a lot of light on what we can expect from them and what we need to be looking for outside help with. Uh, God bless. I hope you enjoy this conversation. All right. Bishop Johnston, welcome to the Simpleton Podcast. Thanks, Clark. It's good to be with you. I have a lot of questions about being a bishop, and I wanted to just start with, can you kind of explain like where you're from and how you became a bishop? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I, uh, I grew up in East Tennessee uh, around the city of Knoxville. A very, if, you, if you look at the United States, it's probably the, one of the most um, non-Catholic places in the country. Uh, uh, it's probably... 3% Catholic now, East Tennessee. And when I was growing up, it was around two. So the good news is it's grown by 50% <laughs> in the, probably the last 30 or 40 years. But um, I grew up there and, uh, and became a priest um, in 1990. Um, I was the first, along with another priest, the two of us were the first two priests ordained for the new diocese of Knoxville. And I was there uh, serving as a diocesan priest for about 18 years. And uh, in 2008, um, just got called uh, by the uh, papal nuncio to the United States at the time to tell me that Pope Benedict had appointed me a bishop. And uh, it's, it's kind of stark and sudden and just right to the point. Um, uh, that I had been uh, chosen by Pope Benedict to go to this, the Diocese of Springfield, Cape Girardeau, which is in the southern third of the state of Missouri, very rural diocese that takes in what are known as the Ozarks, and uh, made up mainly of very small rural parishes. Springfield's a good-sized city, and most of the big parishes are there in Springfield, uh, maybe four or five pretty good-sized parishes, but most are, um, gosh, under 300 families, uh, and a third are under 100 families, uh, so lots of small towns. Um, so that's how I became a bishop, and um, um, I was not expecting it, and uh, then... Uh, after being there for about seven and a half years, was called again, just kind of out of the blue by the papal nuncio again to tell me that Pope Francis had uh, chosen me to um, be the next bishop here in uh, the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph. So arrived here in November of 2015. And uh, so that's a little quick uh, overview of how I became a bishop. Um. When you were a priest, were you primarily working in the chancery or were you doing parish work? Well, at the time I was called, I was doing both. 
um, I had a parish and a mission um, uh, in Alcoa, which is near Knoxville. And my parish boundaries took in a whole county. And part of that county, it extended to the North Carolina state line and took in the western side of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park in Tennessee. And so I had a mission uh, at the uh, entrance to the Smoky Mountains. Uh, and But my, my parish was on the other side of the county, the larger parish, which is closer to Knoxville. And uh, we probably had... Uh, I don't know, 1,200, 1,500 family. So it's a pretty good-sized parish. Um, but then I also still retained um, another hat uh, helping at the chancery office as well, uh, managing the, the, the chancery uh, as the moderator of the curia. That was the fancy title. And as the chancellor, and uh, so I was doing that too. So I read somewhere in some novel that when you're like asked to be a bishop, you're supposed to like refuse a few times. And I think there's like some tradition called the Nolo Episcopore. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Did you like when you get that phone call, do you say, no, no, I can't do it or I'm not I, hadn't, I hadn't heard that. No. So maybe it would have helped me to know that. Uh, I, <laughs> I uh, you know, I didn't even know you could say no. Uh, but uh, looking back on it, um, the nuncio tells you the uh the that the holy father has chosen you for what for what diocese and then he does ask you do you accept and he encourages you uh in his own way uh to have faith uh the faith of the first apostles who were sent but he does uh, give give you that opportunity to accept so um it's implicit in there that you know if you have a i think a a valid reason and conscience to not accept but i've uh, i had no reason not to say uh yes to uh to it uh, i've all i think that goes uh, in my my whole ba makeup as a priest is that um you you go where you are sent and i had that attitude as a priest to try to do everything i could to the best of my ability uh, to respond to a call, and that included the call of the bishop when I was a priest, and so um, sort of brought that same attitude into the, that situation. If the Holy Father wanted me to go somewhere, I, if I unless I had some compelling reason to say no, I should I should make an act of faith and and say yes. So after you get this call. Um, is there a training that you receive before you're a bishop? And I kind of want to know what that is. And I also want to know, what do you understand about the selection process of bishops? And have you been part of that now that you are a bishop? Um, well, to the first part of your question, um, shockingly, there's not a lot of training. Uh, um, and in fact, the, the nuncio uh, has told me, he said, you know, uh, well, just you're going to need to just sort of ask questions and pay attention to other bishops. Uh, I had the benefit of um, working closely with my bishop at the time, uh, Archbishop. Uh, now he's retired, uh, Joseph Kurtz. He was he was the bishop that I spent most of the time assisting, and so I was able to uh, learn a lot just from him. And he he was a great bishop and um, had a lot of gifts, and and so I paid attention. Fortunately, to uh, to him and and how he uh, carried out the office of the bishop, and so um, so I I didn't come into it just cold. Uh, you know, you you learn a lot as a priest too that translates well, I think, to being a bishop too. Um, but um, there the, the there is a a little training session that the Holy See has for new bishops, um, and it's about a week in Rome. It's very academic academically oriented the things i needed to know were a lot of just practical things um you know um when do you wear the miter and uh you know uh some of the other things that are kind of liturgical uh and uh um so there were practical things and you just sort of have to 
start asking questions and paying attention to those things. But uh, there's not a handbook. There, there's, there are some orientation sessions that the USCCB does around certain specific aspects and responsibilities that a bishop has. But uh, there's no school you go to. I think it's... Uh, can, can I ask about that then? Like, um, it seems like bishops over and over again have had to do very difficult things, be like it, close a parish or handle a scandal or something like that, right? And it seems like there'd be like pretty good tips you could get. But I'm just wondering, like, do you think there should be some type of training or handbook? Like, hey, when you have to do this, here's some pointers or something like that. I think it would be difficult to... Um to capture everything um and um there are like i said there are, there are certain uh workshops and things that are offered to bishops so there are those available i remember going uh with bishop kurtz when he first became a bishop to a uh, sort of a communications workshop um with him uh on you know how do you respond to crises and, and that sort of thing in, in the right way? And um, so there are things like that. Um, my committee, I'm a, I'm a chairman of one of the committees at the USCCB right now uh, for the Committee for the Protection of Children and Young People. And uh, uh, we offer a, um, a session for new bishops in November. And I'm getting ready to send a letter out to, I think there are 13 new bishops that have been appointed since our last meeting. And so we try to run through some of the things that are really tied into that very important responsibility that a bishop has to keep children safe. And so that's another example of certain um, specific areas that there are resources available to help bishops. And then what about the selection of new bishops? Have you been involved in that at all? Um, there, it's, a, it's a very um, thorough process um, in which um, the, um, there are a lot of moving parts, including uh, bishops. Um, the, the process includes um, um, lots of consultation. And so, um, if you're consulted about a specific person, you you can't really you can't really reveal that. But bishops are consulted about possible candidates for the Epis episcopacy, and uh, and certainly every bishop has the opportunity to recommend um, possible priests that would he believes would make good bishops. Now, that's where my question's going, I guess. When you think of what makes a good bishop or what would make a bad bishop, you know, and you're going to give one of these recommendations, what are you, like, valuing? If, would you say, all right, Father so-and-so, you know, great evangelist, but he's really bad on accounting, and if you're bad on accounting, you better not be a bishop? Or, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, what are the factors that you think are the most important there? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's very rare that someone has all the gifts uh, of, of being a great accountant, for example. And that's why um, I think bishops have to have really good judgment. Um, you have to, because every every bishop has to have a lot of people to help help him to do what he does. I mean, I have a, a really good finance officer right now. I don't have to uh, be an expert in accounting, but I do have to um, have in place people that are. And, uh, and ultimately, the bishop has to make lo lots of important decisions. So I think someone that, that has uh, the ability to make good decisions is very important. And you can't be afraid to make a decision as well. I mean, um, um, you have to um, ex have the virtue, I think, of prudence, um, you know, in a lot of different areas. But um, I think a, a number of other factors, of course, are important. Um, someone who is, um, is a man of prayer, strives to be a man of prayer, um, certainly is knows the faith and believes the 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 the, the tradition that's been handed on the, of the the apostolic tradition handed on from Jesus to the apostles and uh, 
is um, able to teach the faith in a in a, a competent way. Um, but because a bishop is essentially working with a very diverse uh, group of people, um, someone who's able, I think, to exercise with gentleness, kindness, but also at times a firmness, um, you know, the role of a shepherd. Um, someone once pointed out to me that, um, you know, the the bishop's crozier uh, has sort of a, a little curve on one end, and it's just sort of got a point on the other. And uh, uh, the, that curve is for sort of rescuing people and lifting up people um, when they need to be lifted up and encouraged. The other end, though, is to sort of prod people at times when they need to be sort of poked a little bit to move on. And so there's that balance of, um, you know, of realizing that within the church we're we're on pilgrimage ultimately we're moving through this life and the bishop is there at a certain window of time uh, to move the people that are there with him forward and into the promised land you know that we're to remind people that we're we're not just here permanently uh, God is calling us to a destination and so I think the bishop has to have a, a variety of um, um, gifts to be able to, um, uh, to, to to call people to that pilgrimage and to move us along and to do, give us some direction as to where we're headed and to remind people of where we're headed. Um, I take great um, instruction from a lot of the episodes in the Old Testament and especially... Um, Moses and uh, his his role as as uh, as a shepherd and but you know he he had to move the people along and uh, encourage them but also um, he needed a lot of help and uh, so a bishop relies on a lot of other people uh, to uh, to carry out his responsibilities. So this you kind of already answered a question I wanted to ask but I'm going to rephrase my question to go a bit deeper so you know as a bishop you have this like um, I don't know you call it a herd or flock uh -huh. right and you're going to have people who are kind of falling off on the right hand side and people falling off on the left hand side and stragglers and things right and so part of your job is to keep them together and part of your job is to push them forward right can you give like an example of like when you think of like pushing the church forward right now, what you're trying to push towards? And I've also noticed this idea that a bishop is kind of the bishop to the most conservative and the most liberal and the most social justice and the most, you know, like you're the bishop to all of these people who have these different either spiritual, theological kind of like leanings. Right. Mm -hmm. What is the like, how do you keep all that together and or how do you discern that? Well, the really the image or the paradigm, if you want to use that word, that I I go back to more often than anything else is that the church is a family. You know, our our vision right now is interestingly enough one family restored in Christ, restored in Christ, equipped for mission. But I I think the scriptures are loaded with the terminology of family. And um, certainly a bishop is a shepherd, but um, I think a bishop is also, in a sense, exercises a fatherly role in a family. And I learn a lot from just observing families. Um, and there are no, um, you know, perfect families. I've learned a lot from my own family um, and other families. And so I, um, if you take that, um, paradigm in mind that helps me a lot because um, I look at parents and grandparents and um, many times um, the children in a family are all they're all different and they all have different needs they all have different talents some some children need a lot more help than others um, uh, I know a lot of families where 
you know, their, their children, some of have just wandered away totally from the practice of their faith. They don't ever give up on them. Uh, they pray may even more intently for those children than, than the others. Um, and they love them. Uh, so I take that perspective in terms of my role as a bishop is that everyone is important, but everyone's in a different place. And so they need my, um, my involvement at different levels and in, in different capacities. And my, you know, you, one other group you didn't mention that, I, that a bishop has responsibility for is not just the, the Catholics in his diocese, but really everyone else. Um, you know, that's even expressed in canon law, the, uh, the, um, the bishops responsible for um, all of the souls that reside within his diocese, not just those who are in the, in the communion of the church. So I have to remind myself of that. And so that shapes a lot of um, some of my priorities is that I can't just pay attention to those who are totally on board. Um, I have to be able to help our priests and help our, our lay people to, to be aware of the mission of Jesus and that mission is to save everyone and to bring salvation to the world. Um, there's a beautiful, there's a beautiful part of um, the the Eucharistic prayer, and I think it's Eucharistic prayer three, where when we're praying and addressing the Father in the in the Eucharistic prayer, we pray for all your children scattered throughout the world. You know, you're praying for all the all the different people, but you're also praying for all of God's children scattered throughout the world. And so that helps me a lot, Clark, um, to have to keep that in mind. And it, it helps me to sort of um, balance and sort of direct myself as a bishop. Again, I, I don't do it perfectly, but I find that um, image and that um, uh, response, that sort of that role as a father, a spiritual father, to be really helpful. That seems like the goal. What are the components of your job, be it like fundraising, um, working with Catholic charities, um, pastoring the pastors themselves, the priests, right? Um, how do you actually spend your time? And what's taking up most of your time or? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the bishop has, in a sense, um, a, a threefold role uh, to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. Those are the three, um, pr that's how we typically define the, the threefold work of the bishop is to teach, to govern, and to sanctify. And so... Um, that, depending on, on the day, uh, is divided up around those three things. And, um, some days it's more in one of those areas than another. Um, for example, last night I was in one of our parishes to celebrate mass and to also celebrate the sacrament of confirmation for, uh, 18 teenagers and uh, their families were all there and there were two parishes represented there. So that role of the bishop to um, celebrate the sacred mysteries, the saving sacraments is, is a very essential part of the bishop's life. And so um, I do that throughout the diocese in various ways. Uh, periodically, I still have the opportunity to celebrate you know, the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Used to do that a whole lot when I was in a parish. Not as much now as a bishop because I am not attached to any one parish. But I still do that on occasion different when I have the opportunity. So celebrating the sacraments is, is essential. Um, the bishop's role, the bishop has certain responsibilities, especially around things like confirmation. I mean, that's that sacrament is kind of reserved for the bishop for the most part, but also um, have a duty to um, to teach and at times to defend the teaching of the church and to safeguard that, to make sure that uh, that's being handed on faithfully 
uh, especially within our parishes and our schools. Um, I often say I believe in truth in advertising. And uh, if, um, if something ha bears the name of Catholic, uh, people should have a right to expect the gift of our Catholic teaching uh, presented in all of its fullness, uh, all of its beauty, and um, with all of the sort of the challenges to, to who we are as fallen people. So um, I oversee the teaching of the Catholic faith, especially in our, our institutions, our parishes, and our schools. Um, and then the final area is certainly governance to, to oversee the, the good governance, not only of my, my office as a diocese, but I have a certain role of um, helping and supporting our parishes and all of our other institutions in just right governance. So given those roles and what your, it seems like what the goal is with all those roles, what actually is taking up your time and... Do any of those things ever cause you heartburn? Like, is there something that most you most worry about within all those things? Well, um, I'll say uh, there's always a challenge in trying to prepare for the future. I'm I'm not only worried and cons maybe worry isn't the right word, but there is certain an anxiety about not only the present but also trying to look out on the horizon. And to prepare for what I think we need to be getting ready for. And so I'm always, in a sense, have one eye on the present, but I try to keep an eye on the future and trying to prepare for that. And so a lot of that is uh, trying to find resources and to get ready for the future of the church. To, in a sense, whenever I have a successor, and I will have a successor bishop, um, to hand on um, to that successor um, the, the responsibility and, and the church that's here in northern and western Missouri. So always trying to prepare for future priests. And also, um, it seems like I'm always trying to raise money. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that, that creates a lot of, um, that probably preoccupies me more than I, than I would like. I was trying to find uh, resources to pay for things um, because you, a lot of what we do depends upon the support of the faithful and uh, calling forth, um, you know, their, I guess, an act of faith, you know, to give, to give your money, a lot of, we don't often think about this, but to give from what you've been given to support the work of Christ and the gospel and the mission of the church, that requires an act of faith. So um, in a sense, trying to, trying to find the resources to be able to carry on the mission seems like um, that creates a lot of, I'll, I'll just admit for me, some stress, you know, and to trying to, trying to raise money to, to do good things. Um, so, um, and I know it does for our, our parish priests too. Everyone is trying to find the resources to do to do the things that need to be done. So um, I've been involved, or not been involved, but I've just been in the D.C. diocese and the Kansas City diocese when two major political actions happened. Right in in D.C., uh, same sex marriage and how they were going to handle that, and they were really standing up to the government politically on that. You know, and here in Kansas City. Um, I remember when the Stower Institute was coming in and they were trying to change the Missouri constitution about stem cells, uh, to allow themselves to do some stuff we didn't consider ethical and all the Missouri bishops and professional athletes who are Catholic rallied around. We're doing, you know, um, TV commercials, right? Do you have a sense, um, of like a standard, when you think getting involved in politics like that is worthwhile or I'm, I'm also have that same question for theology or liturgy where like, you know, there's gotta be people or pastors who or groups in the diocese that either theologically they, they're not taking your favorite position or liturgically aren't doing it your favorite way. Right. But like, when does it become like, I should actually intervene here. Do you know, is there like a standard way you're thinking of that? Here's the way I look at it. Um, 
bishops are not politicians, and uh, that's not really our role. Um, however, uh, the lay people uh, are citizens. So my primary responsibility is to form our lay people to be uh, good citizens, to take part in the communities that they're involved in for the good, for the common good. So often people see, in a sense, just the ordinary teaching of the bishops on a topic as getting involved in politics. Um, that's really not my role. Is I'm not here to endorse candidates or to endorse a party, but my role is as a teacher to speak about issues that pertain to matters of justice and uh, the rights of the vulnerable, um, other things that uh, really are a part, part and parcel to um, living in this world and the common good. So my primary role is to help form the laity um, around the gospel, the teachings of Jesus, the teachings of the church. So if a matter pertains to what I would call a, a justice issue, the rights of, of persons, um, that's, that's, that's really part of what my role is and what the lady's role is, is to be involved in our world and in their community to make sure the rights of sometimes individuals or groups of people are upheld. Um, so some of the issues you mentioned, um, pertain to, uh, the rights, um, uh, of the vulnerable to life, you know, the, and right now, you know, those, those, those rights are threatened at both ends of, of human life at the beginnings, the, uh, of life and at the end of life when we're the most vulnerable. And so, um, those are matters that pertain to the common good. Um, uh, and, and there are others along the way, um, the rights of, uh, people to migrate, the rights of people uh, who are prisoners. Um, there are all sorts of things that pertain to justice issues that um, the church needs to speak to, um, just part of our faith. And, um, and yet that's, it's not my role to um, really to, uh, to be involved in, in in a sense, the political process, except that um, my role is to be a teacher, and it's the lady's role primarily to to be active as citizens. So I have a question related to that. So a lot of um, a lot of confusion over the years. Uh, at you know, I just see the confusion come again and again in different waves is about how much the church should do versus how much the laity should do, right? For example, politics is a great example. Um, education is a great example, meaning like say that um, the laity think, you know, we need to have a reform of education or we need to have, um, we need to end nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then they'll look to the church and say, you know, you're against nuclear weapons for the most part. You know, you don't want to be threatening uh, women and children of another nation, non-combatants, things like this, right? And they'll be like, why isn't the church doing this, right? Why isn't the church organizing some stand against on whatever the issue is? I'm trying to make this generic because I've heard this argument many times, right? And then the other question is, well, is that actually the way the church works or are laity who see a problem supposed to address that problem? Like laity are the politicians, laity are the voters. Um, and then the church actually like looks over all these grassroots things and, you know, if they get too out of line, might talk to them. But instead of these like movements coming from the hierarchy, do you think these movements come from the grassroots or is it both? Like is the hierarchy like looking over all these grassroots movements, blessing some and telling others they need to shape up or is the hierarchy initiating these movements? Um, that's a big, long question. Uh, 
first of all, I would say that, you know, the laity uh, are, they are the body of Christ, right? The body of Christ in the world. Um, uh, St. Paul uses that term, and I think rightly that um, the body is one and has many members, you know, and uh, within within the visible church on earth, the the bishop has a an apostolic role again to teach, to govern, to sanctify. Um, the laity possess um, as members of the body, just as fully members of the body of Christ as the bishop or a priest. We're all baptized into the body of Christ, and so we all, in a sense, make up the church. The the um, so I, I would say sort of in a simplistic way, the role of the the laity is to be the salt and light in the world, to be leaven in the world, to be the active agent in the world, in the in the affairs of the world. The um the bishop's role, the hierarchy's role is to uh, again to carry on that role of the apostle. The bishop is the successor to the apostles to transmit the teaching of Christ, the apostolic tradition, to hand that on, um, and to uh, celebrate the sacraments, uh, the means of grace that are necessary uh, for growth and holiness, and, um, and to, in a sense, d to direct the good order of the church. The laity, having been formed by the truth and um, fed by grace and nourished by grace, carry that out into the world as other Christs. Um, and um, if you're formed in the truth, if you're um, if you're animated by uh, divine grace, um, as a layperson, you carry that into your profession. You carry that into your home. And you carry that into the public square as a citizen who votes and who engages in the political process. Well, um, I feel like that's kind of talking about the laity, almost like they're atomistic, like they are, um, we form them and then they have to, wherever they find themselves, they need to do good, right? And I feel like we're in an age of the church Actually, I, I don't think we're in age church. I think this has always kind of been the case is what I'm kind of put, going to put out there for you to comment on is um, like, you know, St. Francis of Assisi is a lay person, mm -hmm. right? And, and then he forms a group of 10,000 in his own lifetime, you know, um, a lot of them. And, and I don't think anyone in the hierarchy was like, you know, what we need now is a bunch of Franciscans. You know, I mean, it kind of came from the grassroots and then it kind of gets blessed by the hierarchy, right? When we think of problems today, um, uh, be they like wanting to somehow make our education more God-centric as opposed to the, you know, a secular education with Catholic trappings around mm -hmm. it, or if we wanted to talk about like, should there be an alternative to the arms race or something like that? Do you believe that not just like, hey, there's going to be a Catholic somewhere who votes as conscious, but do you feel like Catholics should, like, it's the natural way that they should organize, you know, create the little institutes that create these changes or, or, or not, you know? Um, I'm not sure I follow your question, but I, I will say that, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll take a step back because I think I maybe missed one of the things you were trying to get at. In addition to the role of the laity, there are at times uh, moments when bishops have to speak out about certain issues. Okay? Uh, you, you can look back at uh, even in more recent history of uh, you know, when the Nazis came to power, you know, and uh, the sort of the dilemma that uh, the Pope faced at the time of um, confronting that evil, speaking out against it, but also the the real danger of having the backlash of uh, Hitler uh, 
you know, unleashing even more fierce uh, violence and death. Um, but there are evils in the world that sometimes need to be called out as evils, you know. And uh, so the bishop does have a role in speaking the truth in those situations. Um, and um, so I, I, in my earlier answer, I, I, I stand by that. I mean, the, the laity do have a, a certain role to play as formed, um, you know, as the baptized in the world, as again, as salt and light, um, as the as Jesus even said, you know, you don't light a lamp and put it under a bushel basket. But the bishop also at at times does have a role in his leadership to to clarify some things and to really point things out that are going on that need to be have a light shined on them too that only he can do. And so he has to exercise, I think, prudence in um, in deciding when to speak and when not to speak. I think I agree with everything you've said. I'm, I'm going to point my question one more time in okay. a different way to see right. if I can get you to comment on it directly. Um, so here's a new issue that's come into the world. The issue of like um, doing medical alterations on children because of transgender ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, my understanding is the church is against medical procedures on children that physically alter them for transgender ideas. Mm -hmm. Right. Are we as now, this is where the practical question comes in mm -hmm. on how the church runs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, are we as laity to hope that you at the diocese or you at the USCCB or the Pope comes up with an initiative to counter this or 10 well-meaning doctors in a city like DC, Kansas city, wherever bind together and form an organization to counter this like, is it to come from the grassroots, which would be the 10 doctors, or is it to come from the top, like this initiation of action? Mm -hmm. Well, th there, there's a role for both. And um, the what we have right now is, I, th I think, a clash of worldviews. Um, the church continues, and this is the role of, certainly of, of the pope, the bishops, the, the hierarchy, is to continue to articulate a worldview that's of the human person, what we call anthropology, which has held sway pretty much for even outside Christian circles for recorded history. It's a worldview of the human person that's grounded not only in the reality of, I think, science, you know, the, the natural world. There's a truth that's just built into nature that you can observe, but it's also supplemented by divine revelation. Um, this understanding of the human person that has been revealed by God, and those things are not in conflict. Faith and science here you know, coincide. That's what my role and every bishop's role, Pope's role is, is to articulate um, the truth of the human person, okay? And to do that compellingly, because I think it's, it is compelling. Um, but it's also the role then, I think, of those who are in the world, you know, where this is happening, to also, um, uh, to have a, a role of leading their peers uh, in in the same way, to also embody this in the practice of medicine. You know, I'm not I'm not a doctor. I'm not working with children, but there are doctors that are, and a lot of other professionals that are involved. Um, so my role is to articulate um, that truth about the human person in a compelling way, again, that's rooted in, in both science as well as divine revelation, and um, to support those who really are out in the field that are actually working and trying to help young people who may be experiencing that confusion in a way that um, is compassionate, but also is grounded in in, in the reality of being made um, in God's image and made as either male or female. Um, I 
think I should maybe let this go, but I'm going to keep after it one thing. I'm not actually worried about the particular issue in a sense. Mm -hmm. Like at Simple House, we wanted to serve the poor and evangelize. And that was like on the heart from the beginning. And that seemed like the universal call of holiness. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like the permission to form a nonprofit to do that was already given. Because it was the universal call to holiness. Mm -hmm. But very much in the early days, the confusion comes when I get approached and they're like, who commissioned you to do this? Right? Or... Or did the bishop authorize this, right? And the answer was, I think so, just because of the universal call to holiness. But no, we don't have like a charter coming from top down. We're mm -hmm. grassroots up, right? Yeah. And uh, I remember one time I went to the Archdiocese of Washington and I went to the director of evangelization because I wasn't going to get heard by the bishop at the time. And I was like, okay, can you come see what we're doing? And he came and he goes, all right, now what do you want from me? And I go... Well, I'm kind of want like some authorization or a relationship with the diocese in some way. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, that's a very good question. And he leaves and he comes back like a month later and he goes, all right, well, you know me, right? And I go, yes. And he goes, that's your relationship with the diocese. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but, but very much like, um, so to me, uh, I, when I look at the history of the church, I see it as like there's ground swells mm -hmm. and then the church recognizes some and doesn't recognize some, you know, if they go the wrong direction. Right. And I worry that like Catholics, like those, these do maybe pediatricians who are worried about the issue we just discussed, mm -hmm. um, want to take an action, not just in their own, you know, day to day service, but maybe want to organize or mm -hmm. form a group or politically advocate or something. Yeah, right. Yeah. And do, should they feel empowered to do so? Is that the normal Catholic way? Or do they need to like, get a phone call from the human rights office at the diocese because we administer that way? Does yeah. that make sense? It does. And, and the church envisions all those things. And, okay. and so uh, canon law describes um, all of these various um, circumstances that the faithful don't need the permission of the bishop to come together and to do good things. Right. They can they can uh, they can uh, get together and pray. They can get together to do good works um, and do all sorts of charity um, to uh, to strive to share the good news. Um, if if they do want more formal recognition and um, to take on the name Catholic to be recognized in some form formal way by the church there are certain sort of steps to go through that to get um, sort of statutes uh, to to have the bishop recognize them in a uh, as a, a more uh, what we would call a, a person a juridic person in canon law so uh, depend and so some of that's how some of these things that began sort of a, at a grassroots level sort of grew into something even more um, formal and um, got more recognition by the church. That's how sometimes how religious orders get get started is they, they like I was out at the Little Sisters of the Poor earlier this week um, and, you know, St. Jean Jugon, um, she just started um, as a third order uh, in one of the religious orders, but she she saw a blind, crippled lady, and uh, took her into her home. Uh, and uh, after a while, she saw another poor elderly person and took her that person into her home. And after a while, she had three. And then other people saw what she was doing, and they started doing it. And uh, that was sort of the beginnings of the little sisters of the poor. But it began with just her living out her baptism and her desire to bring the love of Christ to a blind, crippled, poor person, lady. And uh, eventually that grew into a religious order. So, um, yes, there is a process by which if, if, a, if a group or an association of the lay faithful want more and more formal recognition and to be under, in a sense, under the bishop directly and to take on that name Catholic, there's a way to do that. But there are so many other sort of grassroots things that are the work of the Holy Spirit. They don't need to be 
overseen by the bishop. They they are seeds that sprout. Uh, they're not. There are lots of things here in our diocese that have sort of bubbled up that weren't my idea. <laughs> you know, there's uh, St. Mary's Home for for Women and, and Pregnant Mothers that's here. That was something that sort of just grew up from from within the church. Well, that's always been curious to me because it directly affects Simple House, but it affects St. Mary's and it affects people who start schools and things. Is that whether when you say officially called Catholic mm -hmm. or when you call yourself St. Mary's Home for Pregnant Mothers, everyone knows you're Catholic. Well, not necessarily. Okay. Yeah, they, <laughs> I guess they, you could be Episcopalian. Well, yeah, or something, they've yeah. they've got they've got some really good Baptist families that are their neighbors, that are real close collaborators out there. Right. Yeah. So um, there are there are like St. Luke's uh, Hospital here in Kansas City. It's not a Catholic hospital. You're right. I I guess I'm thinking that like um, I was talking to someone not in our diocese who was starting a Catholic school. But it wasn't going to be a Catholic school because they, the Catholic uh, diocese and the superintendent of schools in that diocese wasn't ready to acknowledge them as a Catholic school. And they had to meet. Mm -hmm. It would take be a while before they could be a Catholic school, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, if you just call yourself the St. John Henry Newman Academy, everyone's going to think you're a Catholic school anyway. You know what I mean? Like, I, I've always been curious about that distinction. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you just say that when you walk in, you know, we believe in the catechism here and that's what we're going to teach. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think anyone's going to challenge you on your. It's always been funny to me that the Catholic, in a sense, like brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so the bishop uh, is in charge of the brand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so if you're if you're going to call yourselves Catholic, you're basically going to um, you're basically insinuating and, and assuming that the bishop um, is going to be, have some oversight over uh, what you're teaching and if you if you're do if you do something that's contrary to that that he's going to intervene in some ways okay yeah yeah well let me ask about intervening a little bit um, this is kind of taking a modern political concept and putting it on the church but there's this idea of like soft and hard power. You know, like the power of persuasion mm -hmm. uh, and the power of, um, you know, actually intervening, yeah. right? And even as a dad, I kind of know this, right? Like I can discipline or I can look at you weird. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And either one could create a bit change in behavior, mm -hmm. right? Um, it strikes me that I would like to hear your thoughts on soft and hard. I don't want to lead you too much with this question, but like, um, there's got to be things that happen in the diocese that you think could be better or um, aren't your favorite, say, right? But you have to sometimes make a choice between whether or not you're using your soft power or your hard power. Is there any like um, like line in the sand or like, like decision-making thing of when you would intervene uh, yeah, firmly yeah. versus just like coach, you know? Yeah, I... Um... I try to always presume goodwill in others, and so um, very often, I think when there's some some issue, whatever it is, uh, I always try to um, to talk to the person involved. I first of all want to understand um, why a decision was made or why something was done. Uh, so I, I always. <laughs> Ideally, try to get the facts and, and listen first. Uh, but then um, if realizing something was done that shouldn't have been done or something was said or uh, spoken that shouldn't have been spoken, um, there, I, I try to really just exercise my uh, oversight and, and try to invite them to correct it to correct whatever needs to be corrected, um, to do that basically through a conversation, okay? Um, sometimes when there's an intransigence or when I perceive that someone is not acting in good faith or they're um, stubbornly persisting in um, going a direction that's not only going to be detrimental to them, but maybe detrimental to other people, then I have to 
act in a way that basically, um, you know, using the the tools that the church gives me in canon law to do that. So that's what those are there for. Um, so in a sense, to begin presuming, you know, this person maybe didn't understand what they were doing, didn't realize it, or they, you know, they, they're open to being steered in another direction. And very often that is the case. People will, uh, through, through a conversation will correct what they've done. And so you begin there, but if there's, there's an intransigence or, um, uh, a persistence, even after that initial dialogue, um, sometimes you know, you have to, uh, basically restrict people or to, uh, to act in a way that I guess to use your term, harder power, you know, there, you have to do that for the, not only their welfare, but the welfare of others. You don't want them to be leading or impacting people that are innocent because of their, their actions. So that kind of comes into a question that you were talking about earlier about people being recognized as public persons in the church or institutes being recognized as public persons, right? Mm -hmm. And that my understanding, and I'm saying this out loud so you can correct it, is that that's kind of making, giving you like certain rights in the church. You know, like um, there's a religious order that is founded and only within one diocese and there's like the Jesuits who are more pontifical, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And with these different standards comes different rights of the organization in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and these rights are just canon law statutes. Is that right? Yeah, many of them are articulated in canon law. Yeah. And what is the bishop's relationship with canon law? Like, canon law is over a bishop? Are you allowed to ever break it? Like, are you, or you always, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, um, mm -hmm. like say you really need to reel in something, but I don't know, like even priests have certain rights, right? Mm -hmm. That their bishop is supposed to respect. All the, faith, right? all the faithful do. All the faithful, not even just, so it's not just limited to the public persons in the church. All the faithful have certain rights. The Christian faithful, all, if you're baptized, if you're a member of the church, there are rights that pertain to all the Christian faithful. Yeah. Right. So we all we all have rights and responsibilities too. And these are codified in canon law. Yeah, a lot or, of yeah, okay. most, for the right. most part, yes, uh, they're they're codified. And so, the bishop, in a sense, is is a legislator in his own diocese to a point. Uh, so I can make particular law for my diocese, uh, but also am responsible for um, basically. Uh, exercising the law of the church. So there's universal law that I'm bound by and that I can't dispense from. There's other law in the church that I can relax or dispense from. And there's particular law that I can legislate that pertains just to my diocese. So there are sort of, so is sort of, it's, there are different levels of, um, law that um that i'm that pertain to all of us um but there's also i have the the ability as the local shepherd for the good of the faithful to either relax so like i can just you know crazy sort of simple example you know i can dispense from the law of fasting and abstinence and like i think last year uh saint patrick's day fell on a friday of lent so i was able to for certain members of our faithful to relax that so that people could, if they wanted to celebrate St. Patrick's Day, transfer their fasting to another day. So okay. not uh, only you can relax, can you also increase? Could you say we're now in this diocese all going to fast on Wednesday? Yeah, I could. Yeah, you could. Okay. Yeah. I, all right. I could, uh, um, I could do things like that. Yeah. I could say, you know, we're going to have a, uh, a day of fasting in the diocese. Okay. I probably wouldn't go that far, but uh, but I could say, you know, uh, we're going to fast on this day. This is a day of fasting in the diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, a day of penance, a day of penance for, for us. I'm kind of scared to ask these questions, but I think the goal of this interview is to kind of figure out what bishops can and can't do in a sense and what you're, I think you've done a really good job of articulating what the goals are and 
and what your purpose is, Mm -hmm. you know, which is the most important issue actually at stake. But like, um, say you felt strongly that everyone should read a certain book or every college educated person should or something like this. Can you go to one of these Catholic colleges and be like, you'll all be reading Pope Benedict's, you know, this book or something like that. (laughs) Or like, I mean, like, like where, like, I think people really are curious, like, like what, where, what can a bishop do and what can't a bishop do? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, the bishop, um, I, I try to go back to the very beginnings and wh- you know, where did the bishops come from? Well, they came when, from Jesus when he chose his apostles and he gave them certain, gave them a certain mission and mandate um, to, uh, to go out and to, ba- uh, you know, to proclaim the gospel, to teach them everything I've commanded you and to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then you and then you see that developing and how that unfolds in the Acts of the Apostles. Um, so the bishops are primarily charged with being guardians and transmitters of what I call the apostolic tradition, what Jesus did and taught, said, to hand that to hand that on and to bear the life of Christ into the future, the saving power of Jesus that comes to us. He's, he's with us and he comes to us through the sacraments. He's not somewhere way off away. Christ is within his church and the apostles were charged with preserving that life of Jesus and to transmitting that down through the ages so that Jesus can continue to save. Okay. We are, we, he didn't say go out and be micromanagers. So, um, as I said, the, the church is a mystery. We, we tend to think of it uh, very often because we're institutional people. We tend to think of the church as this institution, almost like a corporation and the bishop is the CEO well, there's a little bit of sliver of, of that. We are in an institution. You have to institutionalize something if it wants to continue in history. But we're, we're primarily a mystery. It's the mystery of Christ in the world. Christ is present in his body in a mystery, in a mysterious way. And he's, he's organized it in a hierarchical way. Um, because it's like a body. Your human body, my human body is organized hierarchically, but it's one body. And, the, and, the, and your head has a really important role in governing the rest of your body, but the whole body is important. Every, every part of the body is essential. So I, you know, the church and the bishop's role in it is, is very important, but it's part of that mystery. Uh, and it, it's unique, but it's not, it would be a mistake to look at it simply as some sort of human institution where the bishop is the CEO. The bishop primarily has this same role of exercising the ministry of the apostle within the church, but the church is not primarily just this institution, this human institution. It's Christ in the world. It's this mystery, and um, and that's the beauty of it all. And um, so, my role is to serve that, right? To serve I, that I as feel a like, servant. I yeah. feel like what you're trying to communicate to me is like there's this mystery of the church that is a family, that is the body of Christ, that is all these things, and all this canon law and all this talk of power, not power is in a way, uh, can never be, is just something that we've come up with to formalize and make it work, but it's not the essence. And that if you're going to be Bishop, you have to be in tune with that essence. Well, not, not this formal, like, well, the, the, the canon law is really important because we're human beings where we live in a concrete world. We live in history mm-hmm. and, um, you have to have that unless you want chaos. 
Right. You know, uh, you have to have uh, anything alive has to have some order to it. If you don't have any order, you devolve, devolve into chaos. We would not be here if we didn't have some sort of order. And some, and part of that order comes from Christ himself, the essential order. Now, that's why certain aspects of canon law change. And we revise canon law because history changes, the circumstances in the world change. And um, so some aspects of that has to change because there's change in life. So, so yeah, in a sense, this juridical reality of the church is real and important, but it's never above the mystery and it only is supposed to serve the mystery. Serve, so if you're not, if yeah. you're not keeping that mystery alive, you're missing the whole point by getting into the weeds of the, yes. The, all right. I've got one more question. Bishop. Uh, so you must receive mail, emails, phone calls from concerned people. And by concerned people, they could be squeaky wheels, they could be mm -hmm. complainers, they could be yeah. single issue people, whatever, right? Inside or outside, right? Uh, I remember when Archbishop Chaput was in Denver, he was famous for answering all his emails. And I actually sent him an email mm -hmm. and he answered me within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like, it was weird, actually. It was like, <laughs> how does this man even do this? You imagine him sitting in the back mm -hmm. of a car getting driven around on his cell phone mm -hmm. answering emails, you know? Yeah. Um, what do you wish, uh, like, I'm kind of curious how you handle all that, but I also want to know, um, when I, like, what do you wish people understood about your situation or your job or the work of the diocese that they don't see, that some of the, these complaints you're getting don't seem to get? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wish people, first of all, could sort of see the amazing things that I see and experience in, in sort of just the ordinary life of our people that, um, and, and sometimes I don't think even they see it, but just living the faith in our world, some of the beautiful examples of um, Christian life that I see. Um, so um, there are challenges, but I'm often amazed and part of my prayer is to just thank God for all of the good things that are happening in in the lives of so many people um, I uh, I appreciate uh, the, the people of our, our diocese and I I try to um, respond to my emails and f to my the cards and the letters that come when I when I can tell that there's there's a desire for me to, to respond uh, and I certainly do that, especially for people within my diocese. Now I do get I do get letters from uh, from those from outside the diocese that I think are just you know, they're, they're maybe just venting to all the bishops, you know. And I right. I don't necessarily feel compelled to respond to everything like that, but certainly for those who are in my family, the family that I'm a father to. Um, that I, I try to respond and, and, and acknowledge, certainly acknowledge that I did get their their letter and what the and I heard what they were telling me. Um, so I try to do that too. Um, but it is a full life. It's a I have a busy life, uh, and uh, I try to uh, realize I try to keep it in perspective that um, that I'm I'm limited, and I and I certainly sometimes I. Believe it or not, I, I realize I do make mistakes, and uh, and I try to admit it when I do make a mistake. Uh, I'm a member of the faithful too, and that's why um, I rely upon people to help me, to pray for me. And I think that's why not only the Pope but the Bishop is mentioned at every Mass. That you realize that um, we're we're in need of prayers and help too. I'm not perfect, um, and I. Uh, I'm the type of person I like to talk and, and get other people's perspectives to uh, in making my decisions. I try not to do that in isolation. Um, so it's an amazing life. And uh, people sometimes say, do you like being a bishop? Uh, yeah, I do, um, because I like being a priest. Um, I, in the end, became a priest because I, I love Jesus. 
and I, tr- I believe in him, and I believe in his mission, and it's the most important thing in the world, and I wanted to be a part of that with all the all the crosses that go with it, and there are crosses that go with it, but in the end, Jesus is everything, and the Father sent him into the world because he loves the world, and I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of God's love for the world to, to, to bring the scattered children of, of the world home. So it's all about getting people home. Um, my, um, my column is on the way. And there's, there's a reason I chose that, is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, the early Christians, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, were known as people of the way. You know that, right? And uh, I take that as a paradigm, too. Not only that the church is a family, but we're a people on the way. We're on a pilgrimage. And, um, uh, you know, I like to hike. And I, I always sort of see this life as you were, we're not home. And my job is to be like the trail ranger and help get people on the trail and keep them on the way to keep them, if they take a wrong turn, to try to bring them back, but to remind them of where we're going. And so um, that's what I love about being a bishop is, um, even though I, <laughs> it's hard sometimes, but ultimately it's not only the best thing going, it's the only thing going. You know, <laughs> it's the only thing going. I mean, what, what else is there? I mean, there's just this crazy fallen world uh, that's um, cursed with death. That's all we have to await. If you don't have Jesus, all you've got left is you're waiting around for death. And, um, and that's terrible. And that's why a lot of people despair because even in the greatest circumstances, you realize all I'm waiting around for is death. And um, Jesus broke, broke through that, you know. That's the Paschal mystery. Can you humor one more question on that? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, it's, it's always strikes me like so like myself and others will often think that what a real Christian is is someone who really gets it like intellectually. Right. But for most of history, we've given a context for people to be Catholic, you know, like where maybe this person's never going to really get it. They're not even curious that way or they're mm-hmm. not don't have the intellect in that way. Right. Um do you feel like you're also tasked with like creating the con? Like, I feel like our society now, it's harder. Like, if you're just kind of generically going through life right now, you're less likely to be Christian than 100 years ago, right? Do you feel like your job's also to like foster a community or a setting for people to be Catholic, not just like, you know, give that intellectual like light bulb moment? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, most of the saints um, who who had conversions and even modern day people that are coming into the RCIA, the majority of them came in through friends or a community. You know, we all need, uh, there are some that come in through reading books, you know, they come across a book and it's kind of a, or a podcast, uh, uh, but there are primarily, that's what I think our parishes are for, you know, right. but, but also the domestic church. It's amazing how many amazing families almost serve as that magnet for people because there's a beauty in family life. I mean, you realize that in family life, you've got sort of the kernel of Christian community. And so that's why family life is so important because it's often through families that this orbit, they become sort of like a mini solar system that sort of brings new planets into orbit. And that's what draws people to Christ uh, is through that, that love of the family. Um, so yeah, my job, I think, is to foster that at different levels, at the fa- level of the family, but also at the level of the parish family. And there are other, there are other groups too, organic groups that come up that, that serve that purpose as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think, uh, 
I, I kind of my favorite parable in the in the scriptures is the prodigal son, and uh, I think that's the way we ought to sort of look at the role of the church in the world. Is that um, we've got a guard against being that older brother who thinks he's got everything wrapped up and tidy when he's also when he's got some blind spots but also there's that younger brother who's squandering his life who maybe yet hasn't come to his senses and we've got to look be always on the lookout so for the, for that person because the world is sort of made up by those two poles and the father's at the center calling both to to himself yeah, I feel like when we read that parable, you don't, it's not always preached in a way that you realize the person we're supposed to embody is actually the father, yeah. not the younger brother. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's exactly right. Not the younger brother or the older brother, you know, right. they're both, they're both in a, they're both messes, but it's the, it's kind of, it's the father who's, who's really the center of things that we're called to sort of try to be, be like, yeah. And he has like a generosity about him. Yeah, because they're faith. both, yeah. they're, both of them are his children. Right. And you can only understand that if you've become a parent, I think. Parents really see that. I understand it. I'm not a parent, but I understand it because of how much I love my brothers and sisters, how much I love my parents, how much I love my nieces and nephews. And I, you know, no matter where they are, I never stop loving them, and I can tell you can identify with that father if you're, especially if you've got children, and you love them, and you you'll never not love them, right? You're a dad, mm -hmm. you know that. Yeah. So that that gives us an insight, a real insight into God. I think maybe the the best insight that there is about what God's love is like. Right. Thank you, Bishop, for uh, doing this podcast. Thank you for serving the church. Yeah, thank you, Clark. It's been a pleasure. All right. All right.